Hey everyone, my name is Eric Vaughn and I'm one of the co-founders at Hustle Fund. And welcome to today's session, which is called, How Does SEO Work? Like really. So my colleague, Kara and I, Kara is our head of marketing at Hustle Fund. She and I have been wanting to do this session for a long time, but the problem is that we couldn't find anyone who's good enough to give this presentation. Here's the reason why. If you Google SEO tips, SEO advice, SEO consulting in Google, you're going to see page after page after page of utter garbage. So SEO is one of those things where people who are like advisors or providing whatever written articles, like, it's, it's sort of like selling snake oil, it feels like. It's such a black box or perceived to be as, as such that um, it's hard to tell what is good advice and what is poor advice. And some of the poor advice is just straight up like lies or, or it's totally antiquated and so forth. But it turns out, as we were uh, talking about this session, that we already knew an incredible SEO expert who actually happened to be a personal friend of ours. And his name is Bernard Huang. He's one of the co-founders of ClearScope. And we should have done this presentation like 18 months ago, Kara, because like Bernard's a longtime friend of ours. But he has agreed uh, to come here and share his advice today. We're so honored to have his presence. Um, and you should definitely check out clearscope.io too. This is his company and it does really closely relate to this topic today. So uh, what I want to do before I give a proper introduction to Bernard uh, is uh, first actually uh, send a shout out to today's session sponsor. So uh, we can't do these sessions without uh, really great sponsors helping us to underwrite the editing and put together these uh, wonderful topics. And I want to introduce uh, our new sponsor, GS Futures. So GS Futures is a new multi-stage VC fund that launched just this year, investing into teams at the early seed all the way to um, all, all the way through Series D. This team spun off from the GS Group in Korea, a legendary enterprise representing assets in retail, consumer energy, and much more. You should check out GS on Google. It's a huge company. Uh, GS Futures is actively seeking and investing into great hustlers. So go to their website right now, gsfutures.vc, and tell them what you're up to. I think you'll be excited to partner with them. So thank you, GS, for uh, sponsoring today's session on this topic. So a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, the agenda is pretty straightforward. We're going to just introduce Bernard in a moment and then have him share his screen to walk through his presentation. Uh, this is a reminder that we are on Zoom at this point. This is your thousandth Zoom of you know the last week probably. Uh, and you're probably familiar that with these webinars, we have a Q&A section. So if you have questions for Bernard, please include them in the Q&A section more so than the chat. It's hard for us to monitor the chat. And we'll reserve some time at the end of the session to get through as many of your questions as possible. So uh, Bernard is actually a really humble dude. I've known him for many years. Actually, we were colleagues together at 500 at one point. So he, he's uh, gonna be too humble about introducing himself. So I've decided I'm going to introduce him. <laughs> uh, Bernard is the co-founder of ClearScope. It's a content optimization tool that helps companies drive more organic search traffic. Uh, ClearScope was born out of Mushy Labs, one of the coolest names I've ever heard, by the way, as an SEO consultancy that served high growth startups like DoorDash, Compass, and Strava. Prior to ClearScope, Bernard was a growth advisor to portfolio companies at 500 Startups, uh, which is an accelerator here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And before that, Bernard was the director of growth at 42 Floors. It's a YC-backed search engine in the commercial real estate industry that eventually sold to Notel. So Bernard, thank you so much, sir, for coming here today to share your advice on SEO. Um, I'll stop sharing and hand it over to you. Eric, thanks, thanks so much for the, the introduction. Um, and of course, thank you to GS Futures for sponsoring this, this set of webinars. I'm gonna start sharing with you all my screen. Does this look okay to you, Eric? Looks good, man. Okay, perfect. So I'm here to talk about how SEO works in 2020. And like what Eric was saying earlier, I feel like the most common 
interaction that people have with SEOs is just a general mixed bag, right? You, nobody really knows how Google's algorithm works. And I like to preface a lot of my conversations with like a funny joke, which is like, working with an SEO or talking with an SEO is a lot like talking with a doctor in the sense that a doctor generally doesn't know exactly what's wrong with a patient when they come to see when a patient comes with you know a variety of different symptoms but a doctor's guess is likely better than if you just ask some random person on the side of the street what was going on with you so Working with an SEO and working within SEO is a lot of guesswork. And the best SEOs are oftentimes the ones that are constantly experimenting and making changes with their website and with their different factors and just evaluating whether or not those influence the, the algorithm. So in case you wanted a copy, you can get your own copy here. Just follow this, this bit.ly link, uh, bit.ly slash SEO dash hustle. There's going to be a lot of different tidbits inside and you can snag your own copy there. My name is Bernard. I'm one of the co-founders at ClearScope and before that did a bunch of SEO consulting, which is where we learned about the different factors that were influencing the algorithm. I would say the best component of doing SEO consulting is that you actually build this crazy knowledge base by working across so many different web properties where you start to see that the algorithm is not a one size fits all equation. And we had the pleasure then of working with a lot of high growth companies, testing out a lot of different assumptions and therefore really speeding up our ability to learn what SEO is all about. So here is then a very simplified view on how Google's algorithm works, in my opinion, in 2020. You have technical SEO. The sole purpose of that is really to help Google access, understand, and crawl your content. You have relevant backlinks and this emerging concept known as subject matter authority. This helps Google determine where your content is initially going to rank. And then you have what a search query deserves and user engagement signals. This then informs whether or not Google decides to rank you up or down. Now I have a snazzy um, little screenshot right here. And if y'all have been at least familiar with SEO or worked with SEO at some point in the past, this is a screenshot of the old Google Webmaster tools. And the reason why I have this is because it's a very good depiction of what happens in Google's algorithm. So you can see here on the left side of the screen, you have this, this gray bar, and that's basically saying technical SEO helps Google access your content, right? If Google can't crawl to your piece of content and scrape the content off of your page, then it has no idea that it exists. Assuming that it does, it will then try to figure out the query or search that someone performs on Google that your piece of content could service. You then have the combination of domain authority or backlinks alongside subject matter authority, which is how your existing content within the topic that you're covering is performing. And that gets you initial rank on, on Google search. You could imagine as an example for NerdWallet. NerdWallet will publish a piece of content on the best credit cards in COVID-19. And Google will look at that and say, okay, I believe in Nerd Wallet. They're a huge subject matter authority in credit cards. So I'm going to initially rank Nerd Wallet as position number one or two. And that's then that initial seeding into the search engine results that you see. Over time, then, Google is interested in knowing whether or not your content is actually doing a good job meeting the needs of the searcher. So there are things that are leading metrics like click through rates and like average time on page. And Google will look at that and say, okay, when Nerd Wallet was position one, we saw 40% of people click on that on average. And on average, somebody spends three minutes on that page before going back to Google search or something like that. And they'll say, okay, well, how does that compare with my previous rank number one, which we'll call it Forbes? Right? And if Forbes click-through rate is like 35% and average time on page is less than NerdWallet, you could assume that 
well, nerd wallet's going to stay as position number one. So over time, depending on your content's ability to meet the needs of the searcher, you're either ranking up or down. And in this particular screenshot, you can see that this is a representation of a negative feedback loop. We run a variety of our own websites for the sole purposes of continuing to test different assumptions that we have. Given that search engine optimization is constantly evolving, it's important to keep tabs on what's happening. So we published a piece of content. Google initially seeds it as position 25, gives it three legitimate impressions, except no one clicks. So it drops down. Google tries it again, maybe bumps it up a little, but then over time realizes that nobody wants to click on our piece of content, so therefore removes it from the search engine results index. Basically this then is how Google's algorithm is working. Part one, one question for you, Bernard, on that. So on that test that you are running, was, were you purposely trying to test a bad piece of content? I believe for this um, particular thing, we were purposely <laughs> trying to test a bad piece of content and a poor like title tag to just see how it would influence the algorithm. What, what did bad look like for you? Was it just a... Uh it was just like uninteresting for a human to read? Yeah, so there's a variety of different ways that one could consider something to be bad. We're gonna get into this a little bit more in the further section, but this is kind of the premise of ClearScope. So Google is figuring out what looks, to, looks like a bad piece of content by scraping a piece of content using natural language processing and figuring out the range of concepts that the piece of content talks about. And then it compares that list of entities that surrounds the concept that you're discussing to its own knowledge graph or topic model of what that particular concept should look like. And then once you get the intersection of those two comparisons, then Google has a confidence score that your piece of content is likely to be good or likely to be bad. And we'll talk about that uh, in, I guess, the next part. Any other questions or comments? We had one question about what the x-axis was here, but I think you answered that in that it sounds like it's time. Yes. Yeah, so this is, as you can see, I guess in the right hand radios, like last 90 days, then you could see over a 90 day period of time, Google has decided that our content is not worthy of being on the search engine results and therefore drops off. All righty, then technical SEO. My premise in general is that technical SEO is designed to help Google access, understand, and crawl your content. For the most part, there are some applications of technical SEO that do improve your overall content's ability to perform. I would be specifically known as schema.org. And schema is just a fancy way of saying you're giving Google some markup language so they can interpret different kinds of content on your site. So if you've ever seen, you're like Googling, you know, Thanksgiving turkey recipe, and you see those like big old nice square images showing up on the left-hand side of certain search results, it's because they have like schema for recipes and schema for videos. And there is a small set of schema that Google deems this is truly valuable to search. But other than that, I believe that technical SEO is simply, you're helping Google access, understand, and crawl the content. So first, Google needs to know your content exists, right? If they can't crawl to it, then they can't know that it exists. Second, you're trying to then give Google a good representation of what the piece of content or the page is about, and that's your titles, your headings, and all that kind of stuff. And then access is just simply, you know, how your internal linking, information architecture, and all that other stuff works. And then, yeah, you have things like mobile friendliness, security, and these are all things that Google is looking at. So the way to then think about technical SEO is not that having amazing technical SEO is going to get you to the top of Google, right? Because we could imagine for a second that Hustle Fund has a, a website 
and their website, it literally just says hustle fund and it's a completely blank page, except that's what's intended. And then, you know, they have like, you know, email the founders at hustlefund.co, something like that. But we'd say that that website has zero technical SEO debt. And should you be looking for hustle fund, then they're not getting dinged because the page loads very quickly. It's secure, it's mobile friendly, all that stuff. So where people start to get fancy is they're like, oh, I'm going to use this new JavaScript framework and it just does client side rendering and Google can't load the page because it doesn't know how to load that particular JavaScript framework. So then you, it can't see the content on the page and this is where you start to get ding. If you have a crap ton of multimedia and the page is loading slowly, now you're saying like, you know, minus 25, minus 50, minus 100. Obviously, if Google can't find the page to begin with, and then you get negative infinity, you're not gonna even get ranked in the first place. However, where you get the boost from SEO is having good click-through rates, having good content on the page, and having a strong relevant backlink profile, because then Google is building confidence and saying, okay, I believe that if I serve this URL or page to the user, then it's actually going to do a good job meeting the needs of the searcher. So you can imagine, right, the algorithm is simply just scoring you on some sort of model where it's like plus points for certain elements that they care about, minus points if you're doing a bad job with certain other elements. And that's really it, right? So technical SEO is really just helping Google access and understand your content. I wanna briefly pause here just to see if there's any questions or thoughts about that. Thanks, Bernard. Yeah, we do have one question, which you sort of touched on, but um, Stephen's wondering how the score impacts on that slide were determined. Is it experimentation or the guesstimation, if you could go yeah, into Yeah, yeah. So the, this is purely just me writing down some stuff to demonstrate the like overall like factor stuff. I have no idea what the actual like pointages are. And I actually believe that it highly depends, it's a sliding scale. You could imagine that for B2B searches, well, B2B is usually not needing to be as mobile friendly. You're not going to be on your phone looking for enterprise software to buy and you know, request a quote on your phone. You're gonna do that on your desktop. Vice versa, right? If you're looking to for food delivery near you, well, then you gotta be mobile friendly and maybe you care less about the desktop experience. So all of these things just change depending on the queries that people are performing and the use cases that they're looking for. Thank you for that. And then one other question, since you've mentioned click-through rate a few times, um, we've got a couple questions around um, click-through rate. Is, how does Google know a site's uh, click-through rate and is it only for sites that use Google Analytics? Nope, so Google, has this thing called Google Search Console, which is the evolution of Google Webmaster Tools. And Google has been, well, just <laughs> taking all the data that us as users give to Google for free because we are the product and using that to figure out whether or not the, uh, the content is, is you know, getting a good click-through rate. So if you set up a Google Search Console, they'll tell you in the Google Search Console what your click-through rate is, what your position is. They'll tell you all of that stuff. And they are basically just taking all of the data that we as users are giving them and using it to, well, make the Google Search results better and then you know, sell advertising on, on our behalf. So setting up a Google search console sounds like a good first step for anyone. Absolutely. Period. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Google search console, you'll see this is, this is screenshots of Google search console. Um, I'm not going very heavily into technical SEO because technical SEO is like kind of beaten to death in terms of um, the content already out there. It will be like, oh, headings, alt images, page load speed, mobile friendliness, it's all there. And Google itself in Google Search Console will give you this crazy looking dashboard with alerts and stuff where they're like, oh, look, five seconds to first meaningful paint, bad. <laughs> Fix that, make it, make it faster. 
that kind of stuff. It's, it's interesting because this is an area that seems to have evolved the least from what I remember SEO looking like even 10 years ago. Yep. It has evolved the least. And in my opinion, Google's just gotten really good at scraping the internet, you know, rendering a site client side, rendering it server side, evaluating the two, selecting the one that appears to be the most meaningful or impactful, um, like content experience and doing all that stuff. And that makes sense given that Google's entire business model from a search perspective is in its ability to crawl and index websites. Alrighty, so technical SEO, right? Tried and true, least evolved, perhaps like if you use any like classic framework, like whether it be a Shopify, a WordPress, a Ruby on Rails, a Django, you can imagine that a lot of them have already solved for SEO inside their, their frameworks. So you don't have to worry that much about it. That's why I also like make a controversial statement from time to time that just says technical SEO is, is dying for the most part. If you work on a website, you can imagine like a Yelp or a TripAdvisor and you have millions of pages, then technical SEO is very much so alive because if you, you know, change one element on a website, it influences millions of pages and that is going to be fairly impactful. So there's still a lot of sculpting and like cool techniques that you can like apply. But if your website's like 50 pages, you can imagine technical SEO, you don't have to worry that much about it. This is now kind of more of the interesting component of how Google has evolved is A, how Google determines where your content initially ranks, but B, where Google then determines it should end up. So this, if you've been around in SEO for a very long time, um, you're familiar with the fact that lots of people in SEO say you need backlinks, you need backlinks. And for those of you that haven't been in SEO for a very, for a very long time, right? Google's page rank algorithm was built on the scientific like article citation methodology where they say, okay, if a lot of papers cite a particular website or not website, um, article, then that article likely is groundbreaking research that a lot of people are building on top of. So page rank then from a um, backlink perspective was built on that, that says, okay, if a lot of different websites link to or cite a particular website, then chances are that website is, is probably worth looking at. And people caught on and they say, oh, well, okay, if it's all about backlinks and I'm going to get, you know, content spinner or not content spinners, but just things that spam the web and link back to my website. And you, you have comment spammers, forum spammers, you know, all these different ways of placing a bunch of backlinks that link back to your site. And Google all of a sudden says, uh-oh. People are gaming my algorithm. So I'm gonna crack down on quantity of links and just look at quality of links. And quality of links, you could just say that, okay, well, if you need not just any website linking to you anymore, you need sites that have pooled a bunch of backlinks together and then have those link to me. And then people obviously found a way to game that. And I'll just say that the most relevant modern day approach to that is either being a Forbes contributor or guest posting, right? If you're a Forbes contributor, you apply and Forbes is like, oh, great, you can contribute two articles a month to Forbes. And then these people who are Forbes contributors are like, ah, ah, ah. well, I just take these and sell them, right? So people, you could pay people like, you know, $3,000 a month, you know, under the table, over the table. I don't know. There's That's a hilarious. lot of ways to do it. And they'll, they'll plug you. Right? They'll just say, yeah, check out Hustle Fund. It's, it's an amazing fund. Not like you, know, you had to sponsor it to get that. But then Google right, has evolved and says, oh, okay, well, <laughs> if people are going to trade guest posts and you know, sell like, access to links, then I need to fix this. And the most modern day fix on this is, refers to the fact that Google is now testing the actual quality of the page. So let's take a hypothetical example and say that I, at ClearScope, am going around trying to game Google's backlinks. And I pay some guy who's a Forbes contributor $3,000 and he, he links to me. And I'm like, you can write whatever you want, just give me the link. 
right? So he writes or get somebody to write or ghostwrite a pretty crappy piece of content because that's what likely happens about how SEO is evolving and you got to, you know, pay more attention to stuff and links out to ClearScope. Well, Google's going to take that piece of content and put it in the search engine results and say, okay, well, how is this a good piece of content? And it's like, okay, it's for someone initially seed it higher in the search results. And if nobody like ends up clicking on it or finding what they need on it, it's eventually going to fall down, right? In the search engine results page. So over time, if the Forbes article doesn't do well in Google search, in my opinion, we could assume that that as a link is not very worthwhile. So Google is then looking at things at a very granular level and saying, okay, well, if you know, WebMD is going to talk about the keto diet, well, how, how authoritative are they in you know, that specific subcategory or topic on the internet? And it's going to compare that with other websites that could talk about the keto diet. And you could basically imagine that Google's then drilling down in terms of relevance and saying, okay, should you want to, should you want to build a backlink profile? You can't just get it from Forbes or Huffington Post or TechCrunch anymore because TechCrunch is just an authority on, on startups and technology. And if you're a startup that's working in, you know, cybersecurity, eh, that's not like very, very useful. So Google's using then pages that are performing well in SERPs as a way to figure out that those are high quality links. And we are seeing the shift where you, if you get a, a link from a site that was doing really well in Google search, but doesn't necessarily have a lot of backlinks built to it, it's actually worth a lot of value because Google's seeing that and saying, okay, this page is meeting the needs of the searcher, right? That's why I'm giving it a lot of clicks, a lot of impressions, and therefore whatever it links to, both internally or externally, must be really useful as resources because people are finding what they need on this page. So this kind of bucks the whole trend of, okay, the higher the domain authority, right, like New York Times or Huffington Post, the better, right? Now we're entering this era where the better that the page is meeting the needs of the searcher, the, the more valuable the links that come from that page are, which makes it way more difficult to game the system. So that's what we're seeing in terms of backlinks is that you want to get links from pages that perform well in the SERPs rather than just shooting for high domain authority sites. This is perhaps the most interesting component of how modern day SEO works, right? This is back to this earlier question that Eric asked, which is how do you know that a piece of content is objectively higher quality than another piece? And this is how Google knows. It now has a knowledge graph, which is just a fancy way of saying relational database of topics that powers the algorithm. You could imagine that Google knows anytime somebody writes a piece of content on Tesla, pretty much always talks about Elon Musk, right? These as concepts are just interrelated. Now, okay, if you want to talk about a model of the car, then Google understands that the Model 3, the Model S, right? These are different models of Teslas. And Google understands that there is a loose connection between the Model 3 and Fremont, right? And that's because one of the Tesla factories is in Fremont and Tesla's headquarters, right, is in Palo Alto, which belongs to the state of California. So now when your content is produced, assuming that Google can access and crawl to the piece of content, Google's accessing the piece of content using natural language processing to figure out the entities that the piece of content is discussing and compares it with its own knowledge graph, right? A piece of content that talks about Tesla that does not talk about Elon Musk must be suspicious or not that good, right? So now you have the combination of a relevant backlink profile a topic model check and a content existing like inventory that you have. So let's go back to that like nerd wallet example, right? Best credit cards for COVID-19. You could imagine that say best credit cards for COVID-19, nerd wallet chooses not to talk anything about 
American Express for whatever reason. Google might say, okay, well, usually pieces of content that talk about, uh, you know, credit cards talk about American Express, but this one doesn't. But okay, if Nerd Wallet is doing this, maybe they have a really good reason to not include this particular topic. And because all of the other content that they've produced around credit cards is doing so well, then I am more willing to seed this content higher up in the search engine results. So you have this three way check, right? What is your relevant backlink profile? What is the topic model confidence in terms of how it compares to Google's own knowledge graph or understanding of that topic? And how is your existing content that covers that particular topic, which influences how you initially seed into the search engine results page. So we've worked with a lot of different clients and I can tell you that websites with very high authority or strong backlink profile, when they produce knowledge graph content that matches like Google's knowledge graph very well, we just see them initially seed as like position one, position two. And so this is back to that test, right? That uh, Eric brought up earlier is like, we have a, variety of websites that are strong in certain topic categories. And we're like, okay, well, what would happen if we produced a crappy piece of content that does not hit the entities that Google expects it to hit and put it on the search engine results and see what happens. It's like, we saw an initial seeding that was decent, but then over time, right, the, the piece of content's not doing a good job meeting the needs of the searcher. So we see a decline. Um, so this is now one level deeper within all of this. If you are in SEO, people run around saying, oh, you need to topic cluster, build a pillar page or a hub page. And the reason, in my opinion, why that's like impactful is it's a land and expand. When you build a topic cluster, you're building a massive corpus of a piece of content. It's like, oh, everything you need to know about, you know, fundraising, and what you're then doing is that you're proving to Google's algorithm that your subject matter is good. And it, then you can like win, oh, how to, you know, do a series A, series B, right? You're then building confidence with Google's algorithm that the topics that you're producing are good. And then similarly, why this concept of content pruning exists is because if you have a bunch of pages and they all suck, and then you can imagine that the next page that you publish about that particular topic is likely to suck. So Google's taking all of this in as machine learning signals and saying, okay, well, you know, like if you have high, high signal, then chances are the next piece of content you produce in that particular topic will be high signal. And then vice versa. If you have noise, chances are the next piece of content. That I got a question for you, Bernard, around the topic clustering concept. So this actually kind of merges with this, uh, the, your introduction of the knowledge graph, which is like kind of blowing my mind. Um, so what about like cultural, uh, I guess like cultural nuances when it comes to language? So for example, there's American English, there's British English, there's Indian English. Um, Australian English. Australian Indian. English, exactly. I mean, slight permutations on spelling and so forth. Yep. Uh, is that something that you guys ever try to optimize for? Or is that way too incremental in terms of like addressing all their other kind of like cultural entry points into yep. uh, being like a subject matter expert? Very great question. So we run into this all the time because we at ClearScope specifically focus on this aspect of SEO. And we have a lot of customers in Canada and the UK and Australia. Um, and they oftentimes come to us and say, well, you know, we, we spell organization with an S rather than a Z, but you're recommending it with a Z. And we're in, you know, London. And Google doesn't actually like really care too much. The reason why we recommend organization with a Z, even though the, uh, you know, the, the people that are optimizing the content are in London is because for that particular query, American English based content is, is ranking, right? And so I think first, it's probably too much of a tactical, like, um, 
thing to like really worry too much about. I think Google probably clusters them all together anyways. Um, but second, it's to say that Google doesn't really care that much. It's just saying if this content is doing a good job meeting the needs of the searcher, then a you know, organization with a Z, who cares, right? That piece of content is just better than the piece of content that's using the correct geo, you know, regional, like colloquialism, colloquialization of that particular like topic. Bernard, thank you for that. And that was a great question, Eric. Um, I just, we had a couple questions about backlinks I thought we could address while we're on the subject. That's okay. Of course. Always. Um, so Angela is wondering how significant is the key phrase of the backlink versus just a backlink to the name of the site? Yep. So a lot of people have tested that and the overall general consensus of the SEO community is that a anchor tag with your backlink in it is better than a not informative text. So for those of you that aren't familiar with all of this, you can imagine there's, there's a link that says click here and that is the link. Or you can imagine there's another link that says, you know, best seed fund in the world and both of them link to hustle. Well, the one that says click here kind of doesn't really describe what it's contextually referring to, whereas the best seed fund in the world refers to exactly what hustle fund would, you know, ideally become. So in SEO best practice, the, you know, best seed fund in the world with that contextual like anchor tag is worth a lot more. I would say Google's, Google's pretty smart about all of this now. And um, there, like, there have been tests where people like look at the distance of words surrounding the link now where they say, oh, okay, well, what is the sentence that like encapsulates the click here? Um, so that's to say in a nutshell, the anchor tag, like anchor text saying whatever you want it to rank for is better than something that doesn't. But a lot of people have picked up on that. So if you have too much density of anchor text that says exactly what you want to rank for, then Google is going to raise an eyebrow and be like, eh, it looks like you know too much. You're gaming the system. I'm going to penalize you. So really do it organically. But if you have the option where somebody's like, oh, and you got a link and you got to say whatever it, what you want it to say, then yeah, you should select the keyword that you want to rank for. Okay, great. Heck of a balance where, <laughs> heck of a balance beam we're walking on here. Of um, course. One more question about backlinks. Kathleen's wondering if there's any way to create backlinks if your content is gated within a membership community. Do you know anything about that? Yes. So membership community, right, in search engine optimization, a lot of people would classify this as um, like the same paradigm as publishers. So The Economist, for example, right, they pu publish a bunch of content. They want that content to rank on Google, except their entire business model is, well, pay for the content. So now how do you fix that? In SEO, there's something called uh, first click free, which is an accepted paradigm in Googlebot. So first click free basically says that should a user click into your content experience and it's gated content, that the first click, the person can load for free. And any subsequent page, you can just block them right, and say, oh, you need to subscribe to our platform to read the rest of the content. So that's how all the publishers who monetize with premium content do it is that they give the first click free. That's very likely, right, when you're Googling like coronavirus news and you click in into the New York Times, you're like, oh great, I read it. And then you come back like one hour later and you click on it and it's like, sign up here. And you're like, okay, I guess I'll sign up, right? So that's, that's exactly what publishers do. So just Google first click free and then that's the like proper implementation for how to tackle that particular paradigm. Okie dokie, then moving on right here, right? So we have now technical SEO, helping Google access, understand your content. You have relevant backlink subject matter authority determines where Google initially ranks your content. But really then how does Google decide 
whether you should be rank one or not ranked at all. And this is where a lot of people get hiccuped. I have this crazy looking screenshot. And if you want to know what it represents, it rep represents a, a, a customer of ours who's ranking, you know, in the top spots for wine health benefits. And this DR that I'm pointing to refers to this concept of domain ranking, which is a re reflection of what Ahrefs, a very popular SEO tool, says that this as a domain has in terms of backlinks, right? So a domain ranking is a representation of quality and quantity of backlinks that have been accrued by Wide Open Eats. You'll see here that every other website below it has a domain ranking of like 80 and 90. And we're talking about like NIH.gov being a 93. So these are very authoritative websites in a classical SEO sense, yet Wide Open Eats is able to beat all of them for wine health benefits. So why does this happen? In a classical SEO sense, if you took a look at this, you would be like, yeah, this, this must be a bug. Like there's no way that a domain ranking of 52 is able to compete with NIH.gov and Harvard.edu and WebMD. That's just, that doesn't happen. But it is starting to happen. And this is the best way that I have come up with in terms of describing how SEO works. Right? People will ask a lot of different things like, oh, you know, what are those little sliding scales, like mobile friendliness or backlinks or whatever. And really, it just all depends. So people have questions, right? That's why they're going to Google. They have problems, they have questions. And those problems and questions can be best serviced through a variety of different content mediums, right? The most predominant one that we think about is an article, a guide, a resource. But, right, you have catalogs of local businesses. You have, you know, reviews of different products and things. And so there's different kinds of content experiences and then different kinds of associations that belong to those particular content experiences. So let's go through what I mean by all of this. If you were to do a search for coronavirus, I would say that this is an example of a search query that deserves recency and media authority. So if I at clearscope.io wanted to rank for coronavirus, I can't. I just can't because I'm not a media authority and I'm not publishing content every hour about coronavirus and I'm hella not credible, right? So Google's not gonna rank me for coronavirus. I'd have to jump through a ton of different coops to even have a shot at ranking for coronavirus. So, right, this would then be an example of search query deserves recency, credibility, media authority. One level deeper, right, how to surf. We see like a featured like uh, video. It would be like, oh, okay, this is a search query that this is multimedia. And again, this makes sense, right? If you're looking to learn how to surf, a video is gonna do a much better job instructing you on how to surf than a pure text-based medium ever would. So different searches, different criteria, associations that the user is going to care about. Right, a localized search like Plumbers in Sydney, it's gonna deserve locality, reviews, content quality. A search like vacuum cleaner, correct categorization, brand recognition, user-generated content and reviews, photos, wine health benefits. There we have EAT, which is an acronym in the SEO space known as expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. Basically saying that Google's going to care a lot more, that the claims that you're making are backed up by legitimate, credible sources, which is why you see the little citation stuff that people have, like the Wikipedia style, oh, here's the source of why I can claim that wine is beneficial for you. So what does your search query deserve, right? You can imagine this is a hypothetical example. I'm in Sydney, my, my toilet explodes and it's three in the morning. I Google plumbers in Sydney, I get this, right? I click on this and you can see here, Right, from this particular above the fold experience, I can see that, oh, okay, I can call a local business. I can call them right now, right? There's this 24 seven. And okay, should I call them and they come right now to fix my toilet? I can look at these smiling people and rest assured that I'm going to be safe and my family is going to be safe. So 
It's demonstrating all of the right criteria that I as a user would care about, right? Guaranteed on time, honest upfront like, uh, pricing, lots of reviews, trustworthiness, right? So these people I can trust. Vacuum cleaners, right? The correct categorization, obviously the fact that Amazon is the biggest e-commerce like on the internet and lots of user generated content. So different search queries deserve different criteria. And this is perhaps where most people in SEO get confused because they're looking for a checklist. I said, oh, okay, my title tag under 65 characters, check. Okay, my backlinks, right? Build some, check. But it's not how it works, right? <laughs> different queries deserve different criteria depending on the query. For coronavirus, you gotta update your content or publish new content every hour, every 24 hours, because that search query deserves recency. If you're talking about things that are going to influence people's money or their lives, then Google's going to look more at EAT, expertise, authority, and trustworthy signals. If, right, you have something that's trying to instruct someone on how to do something, then a video embed would do a much better job. And so different paradigms for different searches, and this is how to then start to think about SEO. What does your search query actually deserve? And serve and optimize for the most relevant associations that matches what the user is going to care about for the core problem that they're searching for. So Bernard, question on this. When, when you're advising people then on, on this, this, this paradigm, I guess, specifically, um, I have to imagine that actually for, for people running businesses, not terribly obvious like which, which category they fit in. And I mean, is, does this just have to be figured out by first principles of like, let's pretend you're the user, the user wants to do these things and therefore you're more of like an eats category versus like a recency thing. Yeah, yeah. So we talk about it in the next section, which I'm happy to get to, but just want to see if there's other questions that, that you would like to uh, ask in, in this section. Um, not so much on search query, but well, Elizabeth has a question that I do, I do want to get to. So if you don't mind just hitting pause on this just for one second, All right. we've obviously gone through quite a bit of tactical stuff on how to get started. And now we're diving into sort of optimizing for the results. And given the time and effort and resources that I would take to just get even this far, um, her question is, should startups be doing this given how, how, sort of strapped they are with their resources, like time and money, and some of the other things that they have going on? Is it worth it in comparison with what they're paying for it yep. with their resources? Great question, Elizabeth. So this is the way I break it down to startups. It's either you're, you getting to product market fit is dominating search engine optimization. You can think of that as like, oh, we want to we want to beat TripAdvisor or Expedia. It's like, well, most of their traffic comes from SEO. And so, if the, so therefore, the way that you beat them is by doing SEO better. Then, obviously, you should do it. The second thing I would then say is, if that's not the case, then SEO, from a startup perspective, should almost always be post-product market fit. Because this stuff, this stuff takes like 12 to 24 months. And in startup time, that's a hell of a long time. You don't have 12 to 24 months to just sit around and wait for your SEO to, to start performing, right? So I usually say you should test it in AdWords, right? SEO is just the organic variation of AdWords. And if you're bidding on keywords and you're finding that that's very valuable to your business, that's how you start to incrementally build up target keywords that you want to go after and expect that it's just going to take a very long period of time. The problem with getting started with just purely SEO from the get-go without strong product market fit is because you likely need to pivot at some point, whether it's you know, your target market or just you know, a business model kind of decision. And that could influence the overall like, strategy that you're going after, which then influences your SEO. So I actually usually recommend SEO as post product market fit, and then also making sure that the AdWords component is hitting some level of like traction that you deem as viable 
and then starting to build on top of that. Thank you for that. And then just to piggyback on that question, do you think that assuming we're waiting till post product market fit, that it's also important to wait until startups have picked up uh, good click through rates and testimonials as well? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I say this because we run a, we run a, you know, content optimization software. And if you were to go to our website, be like, Bernard, you don't even, you're not even doing SEO. <laughs> yeah, it's true. We're, we're not. Um, which is to say that there's other more important things, even though we are so far into our, our own, you know, startup journey that we find way more valuable, right? I'd say the purpose of your, your marketing website from the, a startup perspective is conversion rate optimization. SEO is net new audience creation, right? And if you can't even convert people who are already organically coming to your website interested in your business, you have no business trying to attract even more people to your website in the first place. Thank you for that. Um, we have a bunch of other questions, but unrelated to kind of what we're talking about. So, um, all right, okay. then let us go onwards and we'll pocket all of those for later, because this is actually also another fascinating component of Google search. And it will answer Eric's question of, well, how do I even like get started? Where should I be looking in the first place? On the surface, all of this looks fairly kind of like you know, unapproachable of sorts, but we'll go through a live example where I'll demonstrate that it's really not so crazy. So Google really at the end of the day has finally gotten to a search engine that's doing a good job looking at whether or not content is meeting the needs of the searcher. But how is it doing that? So you have on the left hand side stuff that's leading signals, right? Your relevant backlink profile, your, you know, knowledge graph compatibility, your click through rate, your time on page bounce rate. At the end of the day, though, what Google ultimately cares about is that somebody clicks into your search result and never surfaces again in the Google ecosystem for that particular topic. Right? You could imagine then, right, no additional search on Google, given the topic that they're interested in, no additional click on a search result. That is the conclusion path. It doesn't matter that the person spent 10 seconds on your page or 10 minutes. Right. You can imagine for plumbers in Sydney, I landed on that page, I called the person, I closed, maybe I spent 30 seconds on that page. But really what I did was I did not perform an additional search on Google, nor did I click on another search result. I concluded the search journey. So this is an example of a leading signal, right? Back to this whole screenshot that's been following us through the presentation. I have no clicks. Google says, okay, no clicky, no likey. I'm going to remove that from the search engine results. But the ultimate signal is, does your content meet the needs of the searcher by exactly helping them out? So I have this, but I want to do this live for you because I think it's a much better representation of um, how all of this works. So incognito, no, um, no search, like personalizations. This is the head term, which is how to get rid of pimples. The reason why it's the head term is because if you were to look at any SEO like keyword tool, you would find that this gets about 50,000 monthly searches within the realm of how to get rid of pimples. Every single other search is below this, like how to get rid of pimples naturally, home remedies, that kind of stuff. You'll see here when I did this search over here on the left, that this featured snippet, which is Healthline, will have a result that says natural ways as fast as possible. You'll see here this medical news today says fast home remedies prevention, fast. This would be an example of a like topic cluster in the sense that it uh, clusters together all of the different subtopics like causes, symptoms, home treatments. You see here this YouTube says overnight and fast. Dermatologist advice stat natural ways, overnight ideas on how to get rid of pimples, and five tips by physicians. So if you were to just look at this from a purely non-SEO perspective, right, we take a look and say, okay, I guess we're seeing, you know, quite, a, quite some mentions of fast. And if we're to do overnight, right, some mentions of overnight are showing up as well. And you can see here, if I do natural, I'm seeing some mentions of natural show up as well. You'll see here that if I did the search over here, 
for how to get rid of pimples, say, fast, then we're going to see a lot of overlap between this as a search engine results page. We'll see here Glamour. This is the same Glamour here. And this Healthline, this is the same Healthline as what you see here. And the same Medical News Today, this is the same Medical News Today here. Cleveland Clinic, Cleveland Clinic over here. YouTube, uh, this is a different YouTube result. But lots of, lots of the same results are showing up from this particular head topic. And they're ranking over for or this particular subtopic and they're ranking for the head topic. So you'll see here, if I did the search for how to get rid of pimples naturally, you see this health line exactly there. You see this uh, Highlands, right? This is exactly the same Highlands here. So what has happened is best demonstrable through this as a thought experiment. Somebody seven years ago did a search for how to get rid of pimples. And what they likely got back was a set of search results that generically targeted the keyword. And results, right? How to get rid of pimples. The user likely clicks on a couple of these results and says, you know what? I'm not actually finding what I need. So they go back to Google and perform an additional search, how to get rid of pimples fast. The user likely at that point got a set of search results that was targeting that particular keyword and they clicked on some of these results. But guess what happened? User likely just said, oh, okay, yeah. That is what I want. So they therefore concluded their search journey or found what they were looking for. You can imagine then that Google's machine learning takes a look at this as the search engine journey that the user took. Search that, clicked on these, search that, clicked on that. And they said, okay, well, if the user is actually finding what they need after doing this, why wouldn't I just take that particular search result and merge it into the head topic? Now somebody else comes along, does a search, how to get rid of pimples, they get this back as a search engine results page. You can imagine that the user likely saw this and said, aha, that is what I want. Therefore, concluding their search journey without having to perform an additional search. You can imagine that over time, what you see is a search engine results page that gravitates towards intent with the highest likelihood of concluding a search journey. So this is exactly what we're seeing happen here. You see these different longer tail variations, like how to get rid of pimples with home remedies. And these are the conclusion paths that the user took. Therefore, right, if you just took a look at Google autocomplete suggestions, I typed in home. So Google's already like giving me a lot of like home stuff. I'm gonna like close these out and open another one uh, like this, Google. Um, but you can see here, so Google autocomplete suggestions are very strong indications of subsequent second searches that the user is likely to perform after they perform the initial first search. So what we're seeing happen is that that's then a strong indication of subsequent intent that the user is likely to care about. And then Google pulls out the winners of these results and then has it ranked for the head topic as what you see over here. So back to then answering the question that that Eric asked earlier, right? How do you approach this? The best way to do this is just simply by Googling the keyword. You Google the keyword, you see that Google has a featured snippet for how to surf followed by a video carousel. We could say, yeah, <laughs> chances are the user's likely going to care about a video. And so just simply inspecting the types of results that are showing up and the SERP features this is what SEOs are calling these things that show up right here, is a very good way of figuring out what exactly are the core problems that the user wants and then honing in on the correct intent or problem that the user has and creating content on, on that. Uh, Bernard, this is so good. And I realize that we're at the original time. Do you have flexibility of going of like 10 minutes more? Absolutely. Okay. To our audience, thank you so much for also sticking around additionally. No worries if you have to run, but as we, we need to give more time for Bernard. This is some good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's exactly then what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that how to get rid of pimples overlaps with how to get rid of pimples fast. And if you were to just look at monthly search volume alone, that would make no sense from a classical SEO perspective. But the reason why this is working and the reason why you see this concept of parent topics or overlapping concepts is this fact that Google is actually doing a really good job figuring out where users are concluding their search journey and therefore pulling in those results to different subtopics and head topics. 
So another example here, right? Bone broth, search number one, 90,500 searches. Bone broth recipe, search number two, 27,100 slow cooker bone broth recipe. This is the conclusion path. So you see the same result rank across the board. And this is what we're seeing happen over and over again. So if we're to look at pretty much any like high level topic, you'll see like bone broth and then you'll see the auto complete how to make it. And if I do a space recipe and benefits, and then you'll see here how to make it and reasons why you should or benefits and how to make it and benefits. And then you see here, I do a search for bone broth benefits. Then Google's pulling out rank number one, rank number two, and having them rank over here like this for rank number one and rank number two right here. And then the same thing's happening. Should I search for how to make bone broth over here? You'll see this hopefully, right? This is the same hopefully that shows up over there. So instead of then focusing on keywords, you focus on subtopics and topics on core problems that the user has. You'll see this one specifically mm. calls out instant pot. You see here, if I you know, looked at this, guess what you have at the top of Google autocomplete suggestion for how to make bone broth. It's in an instant pot, which is exactly what this one says. So, so uh, Bernard, one thing I want to clarify too, um, not to add more confusion to this really, really good exercise that everyone should be doing. I want to do this for Hustle Fund, by the way, is does it ever make sense to, to get one of those um, <clears throat> um, IP spoofing things <laughs> so that you can test like what the autocompletes look like in different regions that you serve, like Australia or, or UK? Because I imagine that the SERPs are different based on region too, right? Totally. So you can just use this thing. It's a free tool. We use it to actually pull data for the searches that are performed in our software. But you can see here, right? You can say, okay, well, let's, let's, if I search for bone bra and I was in Sydney, Australia, uh, Sydney, like this, like what, what would I see show up over there? Right, so this would approximate like a search in the locale that you want to go after. And you can then see that, okay, we're oh, actually cool. getting the same results, right? So this is back to that kind of question that you were asking is we're just seeing American English results rank like for different locations, assuming that the query doesn't deserve like locality. And so that's why you're seeing American English kind of like pervade the like taxonomy of, of what's what's being suggested or written for uh, but yeah you can see in this like specific order too that what i see happening is like top benefits this one and this one and this is now the difference between being in the top spots for a subtopic right you can see here google's literally saying okay lots of people who search for bone broth care about benefits but only the top three results for benefits actually will qualify for the head topic because I don't have that much real estate. So if you're in the top three spots for bone broth benefits, you actually qualify to rank for the head topic of bone broth itself, but it's kind of in that exact order too. So you can see here, this kettle and fire one is at the bottom of the front page and it just barely qualifies. So if you wanted to actually rank for this topic, we'd say you have three shots of breaking into the front page if you actually went after this subtopic instead, and that's like a three out of 10 shot of breaking into this head topic. So this is then the end all be all of SEO is, is your content actually doing a good job concluding the search journey? And Google is actually doing a really good job figuring that out and then surfacing those results and putting them for the head topic like this. Okay, so right, search intent is now the new paradigm over keywords. We're seeing if you actually tackle a core problem or question that people have with no search volume, that it will rank for head topics. Like people are not specifically searching for some things that we see showing up in the search results. And you're like, oh, wow, okay. Well, people apparently care about that. So it can rank even though there's no search volume. And this is now kind of a, a kind of a ding on topic clusters, but topic clusters are a little bit too broad. Topic clusters are like, you know, everything you need to know about fundraising. And usually in a guide like that, you would start with, well, what is fundraising? And you could imagine that if I'm fundraising for a series A, well, I know what fundraising is. 
And so I'm going to bounce, right? And click on another result that's like more relevant to what I need as a searcher. So basically then the best way to go about this particular thing from a keyword selection standpoint is to identify and create content around the intent that users are actually caring about for the topics that you're targeting. And if we're to just do this really quickly, really live, I know we're like a little bit over, but I just wanna show you how this works. It's not that unapproachable, right? We'd say, okay, Google the keyword like this. So Google the target keyword and then count the number of occurrences, occurrences of each intent that you see. So if we're to do this then for how to get rid of pimples, I would say, okay, the search intent, result number one says fast and it says natural like that. Let's see here, result number two says fast. It says home remedies, uh, home remedies, and it says prevention like this. And then you'll see here, result number three, glamour says fast. This is a topic cluster. So I'll usually just note that a topic cluster exists. And then I'll call out specifically what the title tag is saying. So causes, symptoms, and home treatments or remedies like this. And then you'll see here, this YouTube says overnight and fast, so overnight. And then this one says fast, and then it says dermatologist advice stat. So this is doctor's advice, doctor's advice, and then fast or stat. Um, and then Highland says natural, so you have another for natural. And this one says overnight, so you have another for overnight. And then you have five tips by physicians or doctor's advice like this. So that's it. In step two, then you want to Google, Google the identified, identified search intent and double check that you're right. So what do I mean by that? It means that in theory, I should be able to do this, right? How to get rid of pimples naturally. And we'll see the same results show up over here that we see showing up over there like that. So if we see this happen, then we could assume, at least in the way that I'm thinking about SEO, that the user actually found what they needed here. So that's why you see it ranked for the head topic over there. And so you'll see here, right, if we double check uh, how to get rid of pimples, home remedies, we see a smattering of the same results again, right? This medical news today, this health line natural ways. And if we double check what's happening with overnight, we'll see again, a good swath of overlap, right? GQ, health line, um, this YouTube result, right? These are the same ones that you see here. So fast and overnight kind of get grouped together like this and natural and home remedies kind of get grouped together like this. And you can now imagine, right, if we were to just sum the numbers together, you have four occurrences of this and you have seven occurrences of that, that the highest probability chance you have for ranking for how to get rid of pimples is by creating a piece of content on something that's targeting how to get rid of pimples fast. And you have four shots to break in should you target how to get rid of pimples naturally. But guess what you have as the winning content paradigm? The one that merges them both together. Natural ways as fast as possible hits on exactly the top two intents that the user is likely to care about. And now you have killed two birds with one stone and you've also created the ultimate piece of content from a search intent perspective because it's honing in exactly on what the user cares about. You'll see if I dive into this piece of content, get straight to the point. Here's four natural ways, spot treat with tea oil. You'll see here, this is the representation of the topic cluster. And this is what I see losing relevance. How to get rid of pimples, ultimate guide to getting rid of pimples. What is a pimple? What is acne, right? So you can already imagine that the user comes here and says, well, I know what acne is. I just wanna know how to get rid of it as quickly as possible and preferably with home remedies or treatments. So this outperforms that by a wide margin by focusing exactly on the intent that the user is likely to care about. And that is then the entire journey, right? Technical SEO, help Google find your content, relevant backlinks, subject matter authority, helps Google initially seed your content. Concluding the search journey helps Google decide whether or not your content should move up or down. And now we will open it up for questions. So thank you so much, Bernard. I think that this is one of the most definitive mic drop presentations that we've had in quite some time in terms of a topic that is so black box that you walked us through with such great tactical advice. We saw our chat completely blow up here of 
folks who are just so grateful, um, who are going to be able to put so much of this into practice. So excellent. Uh, it was amazing. The bad news is I think we're out of time okay, in terms okay. of being able to address the questions that came through to our attendees. Uh, really apologize for that, but we got to respect Bernard's okay. time today. We have a request though, Bernard. Okay. And I don't want to blow up your spot right now, but would you be okay if maybe we carried this conversation over to Twitter where folks could engage you and pose some of their questions that uh, uh, we weren't able to get to today? Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Not, not a problem whatsoever. Okay. And if, if you have time, I, I can keep going for <laughs> like another 10 minutes too, if that's acceptable. It's, it's really up to you. I think it's going to be a little bit hard for our team actually to keep going, unfortunately, okay. Makes sense. Uh, but uh, this making time for this was, was well worth it to get through your presentation. So um, a few things here that we want to share with our audience as we're wrapping up today. So we've been speaking with Bernard Huang, who's a, a co-founder of clearscope.io. Check it out, clearscope.io. This gives you a sense of the kinds of expertise that he brings to his clients. Um, uh, already in huge demand, one of the most impressive bootstrap businesses I've, I've seen in a long, long time. And in addition to that, uh, as we mentioned, Bernard is on Twitter. So this is his handle, Bernard J. Huang. Check it out. Follow him. Uh, I think that you know, by the end of today, you'll have 1.2 million followers <laughs> in terms of the fan base that you've been able to, to gather today. Uh, Thanks for being open to uh, carrying on the conversation on, on, uh, on Twitter as well. And uh, to wrap up again, just we want to give a shout out to GS Futures for sponsoring today's session. Thank you so much for all your supports uh, in the series that we have ahead. And thank you again to the attendees for, for coming out, spending time, giving us some extra time to hear Bernard speak. Bernard, man, you're the man. We need to have you back at some point because this was a crazy good presentation. Thank you so much for your time today. No, thank you for having me. And yeah, like Eric mentioned, reach out. A friend of Hustle Funds is definitely a friend of mine. So <laughs> I will answer everything that comes my way. And I'm, I'm happy, more than happy to, to come back when, when the time is right and you'll have me again. <laughs> Might be sooner than later. Thank you again, everyone. Peace out and stay safe.